adoption of the budget. And new last year and this year are these public hearings on first the LCAP and then the budget. And then you, after a significant number of days, we meet again and adopt the LCAP and the budget, which we will do two weeks from today on June 18th. I learned a tool from Julia Roscoe from UC Davis Math Project before presentations, just do a self-assessment to see how we check in before the presentation and then again after, mentally to yourself, see if we can assess whether we approximately know how much revenue we have in the budget for the budget year in millions. And then test yourself about how many students are we projecting to serve next year and how many teachers are we staffed to serve them with. And approximately which percentage of our budget goes to salary and benefit costs of all of our personnel. And test yourself to see if you can think of one major budget risk that we've been keeping on our radar. And see throughout the presentation whether uh, you're right on. Will we get graded? No, <laughs> no grades. I hate these pop quizzes. I think I just saw the, the answers are in the back of the book. <laughs> just as far as we know them from the May revise, what the local control funding formula means to us as a community funded district and a district of choice, what that means then to our budget and what assumptions went into our budget current year and projection out two years beyond the required budget of 15-16 and some concluding remarks. So at the state level, this is our third year in the local control funding formula, Governor Brown's uh, method of school finance reform. And under the local control funding formula, much like under revenue limit funding, the district uh, of choice and basic aid are defined. As a basic aid district, it's defined as a district that does not receive state aid to fund the entitlement transition into the funding formula. So we receive no state aid from California as we evolve into the LCFF with the exception of district of choice that we'll talk about. It does, however, honor hold harmless, at least temporarily, hopefully going into the future of those categorical funds that we used to receive in 2012-13 at that level, and we'll touch on that a bit. And as a district of choice, we receive 70% of the revenue that Fort Bragg and Anderson Valley would have received for serving those students that come into us from those districts. And new in the budget year is this one time $601 per ADA that we budgeted at just over $300,000 for 1516. And that's because the state of California is doing so great. There are a variety of reasons. It's also supposedly a payback of the mandated cost obligations that the state has for all of the districts. So we're getting this one-time funding because the state is able to pay it, and the state's also considering this as a payback of some, some of those <laughs> write-offs. That's controversial because every district's receiving the money, and not every district deserves mm -hmm. mandated reimbursements. So this is the local control funding formula, and the bar on the left is what we would look like funding-wise under the traditional LCFF method, and it totals $4.8 million. So here's the base we would get for serving all of our students, the supplemental for the students that qualify for free and reduced meal and the English language learners, those student populations we just talked about with the LCAP primarily, and then class size reduction, career tech ed, and the, the transportation add-on. However, as a basic aid district, our local taxes are greater than the base under LCFF, so we, re we remain a basic A district. This is LCFF at Target, by the way. And on top of the taxes, which are about $4.7 million, we have district of choice revenue coming in, about $388,000, and the categoricals and the transportation add-on, which is the whole harmless revenue. The next chart simply shows the math for that graph. And you can see under the local control funding formula, there's a different dollar figure for each grade span. 
There's the additional add-on for the free and reduced price meal qualifying students and the English language learners, and the add-ons for CSR and CTE that then total here, and here's our basic aid totals. And right here, these three top lines are our 1.5 million in hold harmless. And just again, real briefly, here's the chart of all of the revenue streams that make up that 1.5 million for us. And we only keep talking about that because it's about 20% of our revenue. So it's very significant for us. And there is still a risk that that might go away once all school districts across the county reach their LCFF target. We're working hard to have that interpretation by the CDE mean, though, that it is in perpetuity. When is it projected now that they'll uh, fully fund LCFF? That is really variable. When the governor first proposed LCFF, it was projected at eight years. Mm -hmm. Now the state economy is so improved, it could be, it's likely to be sped up. It could even be as early as two or three years from now. Mm -hmm. So the uh, key to any budget is the assumptions. And on the revenue side, Jason and I worked hard to come up with these assumptions with the help of the finance committee. And our secured roll taxes, we're assuming, grow 1% in the budget year and then 1 and 1 quarter percent in the out years. District of choice coming in at 388,000. We do benefit with the LCFF district of choice because Anderson Valley and Fort Bragg, their gap closure to their target level is much closer now with the state economy improving. So our district of choice revenues increased due to that gap closure of those two school districts. The whole harmless revenues, the education protection amount revenues of $200 per student. Now remember that goes away after 1718. So the next time we look at a projection, that $100,000 will be eliminated. The one-time discretionary dollars we just talked about, the $601 per ADA. When did you learn about that? That was the May rebus. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of weeks ago is when we learned about that. It may change. It may be a little bit higher. We'll know that when the state finally approves their budget by June 15th, if it's on time and it's likely to be. Is there any talk about um, repeating that next year if the economy continues or they can do something else? I have heard no talk about that. But that is a nice way to do it because it's outside of the LCFF formula, so basic aid districts do that. MCN contributing $40,000 and MUSE contributing to the culinary program. On the expenditure side, salaries and benefit costs make up the lion's share of our expenditure budget. $3.3 million for certificated salaries, $1.6 million for classified salaries, and the benefit costs for those salaries is just under $2 million. And what this graph does is shows us if Staffing levels remain static. What's the budget pressure going into the 16, 17 year if we keep the exact same staff? So the gray boxes show just the step increases of all of the people that we have, and that's about $148,000. And the orange boxes show the cost of the 1.92% increase in that 16, 17 year. And that costs about 110000 The blue is just the one-year cost increase of PERS and STIRS into the 16-17 year. And that's about 84000 And then the green is just range movement for certificated staff receiving new units or getting master's degree stipends. So if we do nothing and we know our revenue is relatively flat, the increased pressure on the budget for just this one year, you don't see it here, it's blacked out, but it's about $360,000. And that is in the projection. So before looking at the projection, let's also look backwards at revenues. And you can see here the roller coaster ride we've been taking on revenues. And this was the state economy improving and then all of a sudden starting to decline. With our declining ADA, because back here we were still a revenue limit funded district. Here we turned the corner into the basic aid funding model. Then we had the state tank and our tax revenues start to drop and be 
flat. But last year, the LCFF kicked in. We all are taxed higher. The state's receiving more funding. So we saw an increase in revenues. Now that revenue stream is projected to be relatively <coughs> flat. You see these three spikes, and they're described right here in the three bullets, but they're one-time revenues. And two of the three are restricted to the uh, Prop 39 clean air energy movement. So uh, revenue is pretty flat in the projection. And this red box shows the projected revenue for the budget year and two years out. And keeping those in mind then, that's the top line of this multi-year projection. Y1 is our budget year, 15-16. That's the column that you'll be acting on when we meet two weeks from tonight. But basically, you see the revenues relatively flat and the expenditures increasing primarily because of those personnel costs we were talking about. And we do have some retirements in the assumptions in this multi-year projection. Then transfers in from MCN, transfers out to cafeteria and preschool lead us to this projected decrease in the fund balance. So projected deficit spending each year. And then down at the bottom of the multi-year projection, you can see our general reserve after commitments and assignments and designations uh, does decline. The detail of this multi-year projection was in your budget packet and it's in the handout. But this view is much better looking at 1718 than we were thinking this time last year and some of the nice things that happen budgetarily are shown on this slide. First, the May revise, the $601 per ADA in unrestricted. Again, not ongoing, but very helpful, we'll take it. The improvement in district of choice revenue as Fort Bragg and Anderson Valley's LCFF formula increases. Our share of that does increase as well for serving those students that come to us. And then, Thankfully, we saw a decrease, a significant decrease in workers' compensation rates for our district. Just a few years ago, we were the second highest in the two counties that are in our consortium. Now we're amongst the lowest. And we are projecting in the projection that it remained low. So let's hope that that happens. Now looking at enrollment, Back in 1993-94, we served more than 1,000 students in our district. And as you know, for the past several years, we've been in the mid-500s. This graph shows the significant decline. Back here is when we turn to base aid, and we've been relatively flat on enrollment in the history and in the projection. Slight uptake expected in the future years. We use the cohort survival method of projection here. Most of the decline is happening, as you can see, in the orange bar at the high school level. So it's interesting, looking at this decline in enrollment, what's been happening with our staffing? So here you see in 1516, there's two of the quiz questions, 562 students were projecting enrollment, and 46 FTE certificated teachers are in our budget. And just 10 years ago, we had 100 more students than now and fewer teachers. This ratio shows the ratio of students to certificated FTE, and we are the lowest that I could find in history, which does support our strategy of student success and it supports the goals in the local control accountability plan that we were just talking about. With those changes, let's also look at classified and <coughs> admin manager positions. This top row shows the average daily attendance expected now. So next year's ADA is expected to be about 513. Four years ago, it was one half of 1% lower. On the staffing side for all of the positions, we are 17% higher. So again, well served to meet the success of our students. But graphically, which you can see what happens, in this graph, the ADA is flat as the orange bar. And the gray line 
is our total FTE staffing levels. We've been growing. And this graph shows the ADA now is the gray line that's relatively flat, and the orange line is our total staffing costs that are growing. And the costs are driven not only from the increased staffing levels, but those increased person and STRS costs as well. So total staffing of our budget, this is one of the uh, little quiz questions, 86% of each dollar we're budgeted to spend in 15-16 goes towards our personnel side, salaries and benefits. That wraps it up for the general fund. Looking at some of our other funds, Fund 12 is our preschool fund, and we're budgeting to contribute just about $50,000 into the preschool fund in the budget year, and contribute just under $74,000 to the cafeteria fund. Our ongoing support of the deferred maintenance fund is $100,000 a year in the budget year and in the projection. The special reserve fund that we established two years ago holds 827000 after the assumptions of interest rates. And our bond fund that we opened seven years ago, we're going to close them. So more than $28 million in bond projects. We have now, we're in the black. We're able to close fund 21 and fund 22 for those projects. On time and on budget. The developer fee fund should end up with a balance of $150,000 if the $75,000 we assume in developer fee revenue comes in. We only are looking at $50,000 for this year, so we're hoping that developer fees start to increase with the economy. You will hear the MCN budget from SAGE next time we meet on the 18th. And our self-insurance fund, we're self-insured for dental and vision. We're expecting to break even and be self-funding. The key budget risks, you are familiar with these. The deficit spending is not sustainable. We are using some conservative figures for tax revenues, so we hope that those come in higher, or we'll be looking at the program. We are hoping that the hold harmless provisions continue forever, and we still are waiting for the clear definition from CDE, whether that happens. That's a significant budget risk for us if it doesn't. The District of Choice provision sunset on January 1st of 2017. There is Senate Bill 597 that extends that for one year. We've been working hard with the other districts of choice to extend that. And then we do hope that after that one year extension, it's extended again. We are showing the District of Choice revenues in the three years of our projection. Retirement pension costs will escalate as we have talked about. And then sponsorship for a charter school is always a risk for a basic aid district because it's an immediate and direct rechanneling of our tax revenues by the state to fund that charter school. So how'd you do on the quick survey? All right, the finance committee members are smiling. <laughs> Total revenues just under eight million. Total students, 562, 46 teachers to serve them, 86% of our budget for staffing, and we just discussed the major risks. So the backup data you have in your chart, on your package, are the school services financial projection that pretty much every school district in the state uses to build their budget and their projections. For us, you also have the tax history and tax projections enrollment history and enrollment projection. Fund 01 in the state required format, it does a really good job of showing every element in a standardized fashion in the multi-year projection. And I also threw in there the reserve report that you will be acting on when we meet on June 18th. That's a new requirement of the state to make it really clear what dollar figures we have in our reserve, what are committed in the site. So our next steps, the auditors were here yesterday, and we have expectations for an on-time on state budget, June 15th. 
And next time we meet, shortly after that, adoption of the LCAP, adoption of the budget. We don't have a public disclosure of the negotiated agreement for the new stipend positions, and those are all in the budget, too. The education protection account required disclosure now every year, and the reserve level disclosure that you've got in the handouts. And then we expect to submit the budget on time. Conclusions are that uh, we will file a positive certification, meaning we meet our financial obligations. We are projecting deficit spending, so we'll keep our eyes on that and hopefully see a turnaround. And then finally, thank you to the board for putting up with the ups and downs and roller coaster budgets of the past, and the board finance committee for your constructive input and recommendations. And Jason, it's been really great to work on the LCAP. I never thought I would say that, but dovetailing the LCAP with the budget and the budget with the LCAP has been really great to do. And as I built this budget, you saw in the packet, we overview every year the strategic plan. And I'm looking at the strategic plan and I'm saying, yeah, we're doing it. So it's really nice to see that accomplishment coming out and seeing the budget that supports it. And to staff, thank you, Gail and Kim in the district office. It's, it's been a great year and I'm looking forward to the next.